Welcome in to another edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast, Bubba, Bubba, Bubba. You know, reality TV is something that is, I mean, when I say that now, you're like, oh yeah, there's another oh, reality yeah. show it's, that's it's out. and Common, common it, it, now. But you and I have been around long enough that we remember when this genre started. And remember, we would talk about it, what do we mean by reality and, and this and that. And, and when you look at the pioneers of that, uh, real world MTV, uh, they they were one they were if not the first out uh, they were in the first that came out yep. first and, one or two for sure yeah and so I remember watching that going this is kind of a new kind of TV <laughs> it, it's really kind of awkward I'm not sure I should be seeing this <laughs> yeah. and you um, didn't know if you should yeah, watch or yeah, not yeah, yeah what 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 is real what is not is this real these young people live in this nice house okay that's not real uh, but uh-huh. uh, but it really did lend itself to some. Um, uh, historic television, and so it came back, and after the first season, they said, let's do it again, and we were introduced to the pride of Owensboro, Kentucky, John Brennan, in season two of MTV's Real World, and if you are wondering, where are they now? Uh, John Brennan is now with us on Rick and Bubba University. John, welcome to Rick and Bubba University. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I got that right, season two, right? Season two. And what year was that? So 1993, they did. It was the wow. second season. So 1990, I, my season was 93. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't seem like it should be that long. Thirty years, <laughs> exactly. And and you were telling us. So let's get that. You know, we're gonna we'll years. go back, but let's talk about what just happened, and then we'll get into what is happening. But but before we go back, you get a call after 30 years from MTV, and they say, John, let's do it again. Let's do a reunion show, yeah. and uh, and I know there's some things with that with the agreements that we won't get into, but we can we at least in general say when when y'all were all a lot of wide eyed kids, th- they got you, and 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 and, and that you were just <laughs> wanting to be on TV, so they didn't they didn't have to they didn't have to provide a lot to get you to say yeah I'll be on a TV show, <laughs> but when they call you 30 years later and you and you're out in the real world no pun intended, uh, you're like, well, for us to come back together, y'all going to have to take care of us a little better than you yeah. did last time. Yeah, sweeten the deal. Yeah, and, and, and they did do that, so that's good. They did do that. Yeah, and uh, so there, we just had the reunion. People can see it now on Paramount uh, Plus. That's right. And y'all did uh, eight episodes. Correct. And uh, so tell us first what that was like to get that call and to go back and how many people did come back from that season. Well, I always had a, a, a kind of a hunch that they would call us one day because in our contract 30 years ago, it said, you know, words like in perpetuity, right. yeah. words we had to look up and say, hey, what's this mean? And, and it always lended itself to, hey, anything that spurs off of this, we still own. And, and you know, you, you you don't have to agree to do it later, but it was in, you know, it was beneficial for me to do later. And so I kind of had a feeling that one day my phone would ring and they would say, how about getting the band back together? And, um, and, and actually they put us back in the exact same house in Venice beach, California. So that was just weird. Cause the whole first experience <laughs> yeah. was kind of a, a nightmare slash dream, you know, real, uh, a surreal type experience. And to go be put back in that same exact house with those same exact people in a really strange environment was was just crazy. But I knew the phone would ring one day and they'd want to do it. And it took me about four seconds to say yes, because it was a great opportunity for me and it was a great experience for me the first time. Not for everybody that I lived with, um, but it was an opportunity for me to throw myself back out there in the limelight and say, hey, I'm, this, is, this is what I've been doing. This is who I am. This is who I was when I was 18. But now, you know, I'm 47 years old, 48 now. But That's a big difference, isn't it? How about that? Big difference in perspective <laughs> of life. So much. And, and so how many – did everybody get back? No, they didn't. Okay. We, we had – you know, our show's called um, – it's, it's the real world and it's the true story of seven strangers picked to live in a house to find out what happens – when people stop being polite and start being that. real. Yeah. That's the opening. I remember that. Yeah. And uh, we had, uh, we were the first reality show to kick somebody off. And this was not an elimination show where you're supposed to eliminate right. people. And so we replaced him. And then we had a young lady that um, got married and moved out. And that was planned. So we actually had nine total. And so we had seven of the nine returned. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. John, talk a little bit about how you got involved with this to begin with. Yeah, back, you're, back you're, you're how, how did you ever get on this? Because, I mean, people didn't know what a reality show was then. Yeah. No, there, I've been saying for 30 years we were the first reality show ever, ever 
And uh, and then somebody very recently said, well, yeah, I guess you were, except for cops. And I went, oh, <laughs> wow, I guess cops might have been. Well, <laughs> you know what? I didn't think about that. Yeah. Yeah. But now, you know, there's, you know, The Voice is a reality show. American Idol is a reality show. There's yeah. so much that they lump into it. So, but, uh, you know, they actually, somebody told me, somebody that really cared a lot about me, sewed a lot into my life when, when I was considering doing it, said, uh, <laughs> You you know you really ought to do this because this genre of entertainment that you're describing is never going to last. Oh wow! And so, you know that's in, in 1992 slash three. That's what people were thinking. This this idea. I was I was in Nashville um, at Belmont University. I had graduated high school just before that, and I was one semester into my college <laughs> at a very nice. Yeah, music yeah. business, yeah. expensive college in Nashville, which good was a good place city. to be. Man, yeah. I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life in Nashville. And somebody literally walked up to me in downtown Nashville and said, "Hey, uh, you know, I had my hat, and my boots, and <laughs> sure, you got to remember what was happening in the world in 1992. I mean, Garth Brooks, Garth Vince Brooks, Gill, yeah. Yeah. Alan Jackson, yeah. everybody. I mean, it didn't matter if you liked country music or not. They had taken over the entertainment scene, not just the music scene." And MTV decided that they wanted a, an aspiring country music singer, so they came to Nashville and looked for one. And I never really applied. And they, you know, they actually had a hard sell getting me to be on the show because they're like, "Yeah, and you'll live in this big house and you'll be on MTV." And I was kind of <laughs> not really impressed with MTV because, you know, of of my upbringing. And, yeah. And I was a country music singer, so there wasn't a lot on MTV for me. And I was like, well, you know, actually, my mom blocked the channel, so you know, <laughs> I was a hard, I was a hard sell. And the more they talked to me, the more they wanted me on the show because I was because very, you were so you represented a part of the culture they really wanted. They wanted yeah. they wanted me because I was a country music singer, uh, aspiring, you know, yeah. eighteen years old. Where are you from? I'm from Kentucky. Well, you probably never left the state in your life, and so you probably are super naive. And you're going to go crazy when you get to Los Angeles. You're perfect for this show. <laughs> and uh, the storyline really changed when I got out there because it became less about my cowboy hat and my boots and my desire to be a country music superstar. And and they didn't realize that, you know, that my father uh, is in heaven now, but he was an FBI agent for 28 years. Oh, wow. And I was actually, I'm from Kentucky, but I was born in Wisconsin and lived in Phoenix, Arizona, Baltimore, Maryland, Eastern Kentucky, Western <laughs> Kentucky. You're a little more traveled I've than been they ev- Oh, they, they had no idea who I was. And they didn't right. know that when I was five years old, Jesus saved me in Phoenix, Arizona. Right. So the storyline really changed from... I mean, back when they had TV Guide, remember that when that was a thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. TV oh, yeah. Guide called me the, the prudish, Bible-thumping Christian cowboy I, singer. I, <laughs> I, I totally remember when that narrative flipped. Yeah, it did. And because, you know, we were always covering it because it was such a new genre. We talked about yeah. it in the early days of the show a lot. And um, and you're right. And and I remember saying, uh, because as, as followers of Christ, too, I remember us talking about, oh, they're, they're really going to grill this kid. Now they're they're going to try to make you know uh, devotion to, to to Christ look you know silly and and yeah. they were condescending and judgmental yeah. and and all and they certainly did try that didn't they they did um, they didn't understand me of course you know it's a house full of freaks I yeah, mean right. and what I realized very shortly into the experience was I'm one of the freaks like I thought I was normal <laughs> I'm as I'm as unique slash different slash weird to these people as they are to me. They have no idea what my background and upbringing is like. They have no idea what my life is like. And, and we were seven of us with very strong personalities and very, very different. And as they got to know me, it, it, it did start out, hey, John, you're, you're very, you're very narrow minded. I mean, right. my roommate, Tammy, looked into the camera and says, John is so narrow minded. He thinks Jesus is the only God. Right. And then they played the song. I can't remember who it was, but they free your mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, and then they right. went off to commercial like John is so narrow minded. He's not open to other ideas. It's like, well, I'm kind of I'm, I'm living with you. So I'm open to some craziness. <laughs> right. Yeah. But if you're going to try to talk me out of Jesus being God, I'm pretty stubborn there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and, and again, we've said this before and, and you tried to make that point. You can't really be a follower of Jesus and that have any credence if you don't also adhere to what he said about himself. That's right. right? He's the one who said that. We didn't come up with that. Yeah. And and as his followers, we can't say that we're his followers. Then we say, except for that. Right. You know, he said he was exclusive. He yeah. said he was the only way. That's not something yeah. that we came up with. But as his followers, followers, we adopt that and believe that. Yeah. Or we wouldn't really be followers. Yeah. Yeah. And it is crazy. I mean, so, I mean, people started to really, they loved me. And they got, as they got to know me, they realized, hey, there, there's a lot of love in this guy's heart. 
and I wasn't perfect and, and I'm not perfect, but um, they started to see through the outer core and the stereotype that they had for me and the one that even the network was brewing. And yeah. then the network fell in love with me too. Like, yeah. honestly, I mean, they, they covered me when, when I could have really looked bad and they, they made me look great. And so, I mean, um, it was a great experience for me. I have made no. Really so you don't feel regrets. like they really ambushed you and mistreated you. I mean, they try that. We understand what they were trying to do, yeah. but there came a moment where you yeah. kind of won them over. I think so. That you weren't the stereotype cartoon they were trying to create. Yeah. John, do you think it was you that won them over or do you think they were getting polling information from all their That's marketing true. folks that, Hey, they kind of like this guy. Maybe we need to, not to try to pigeonhole him quite so bad. We may have I, a star on our hand. Well, I don't know. I, and, and what is a reality star, really? Yeah. I mean, um, you're famous for, for being, you know, yourself. So that, that's kind of I'm famous, <laughs> famous for nothing. Uh, it's so weird because, uh, you know, I've, I've been in, in youth ministry for the last, you know, 22 years. And, and uh, you know, I'm trying to impress the teenagers I'm working with. And, hey, I was on MTV. And they're like, well, John, we hate to break it to you, but that's a little lame nowadays. Right. <laughs> I'm like, OK, all right, let me tell you. <laughs> let me, that's, that's no longer. Yeah, yeah. Let me explain it to you then. Um, let's see. What's the what's the most influential thing in your life? TikTok. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's pretend that I'm a Kardashian on TikTok. That's right. how. Well, I, you know what? Yeah, actually, yeah. That, at that time, you were. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. how crazy it was, and and I, I think you know the show didn't air until um, I got home. I got I flew back to Nashville the day the first the first episode aired, so people weren't watching it in real time. So I think it was my roommates and the producers that went, okay this kid from Kentucky's got a whole lot more of a story than we thought. Right. And the way I was reacting, I mean, one of my roommates had an abortion on the show. That was a whole episode. Yeah, and I remember that. Ooh, what's Christian John think? And here's where John's going to get really this and really that. And we're going to be able to, you know, pin him to the wall with his faith. And, and I just, in every way, tried to come across loving and supportive and, and still hold my ground. And, and I, I mean, I won my roommates over and then they slowly, they slowly, um, I, I believe, you know, begin to respect me, and and uh, and then the viewers were like, "Okay, that kid's, you know, strange, and I don't understand where he's coming from, but kind of like him." <laughs> well, we'll come back. We'll continue. John Brennan getting updated on on what's going on with him now, but looking back on the things he's already been through. When Rick and Bubba University, the podcast continues. This is the Rick and Bubba Show. Watch more at blazetv.com slash Rick and Bubba. Rick and Bubba. Rick and Bubba. So Rick and Bubba University, the podcast, this episode, John Brennan is our guest. So we, we talked about, you know, how you ended up on the second season of, of really, other than cops, we'll say that now, you know, before we get the same email you did, uh, other than cops was the first reality show. And, and I can so vividly remember you being on that show. Did you, did you, and we talked about the part about how you won yourself over to those that thought here comes the freaky, narrow-minded self-righteous, sanctimonious, uh, you know, uh, yee-haw uh, guy from, from, from the South. And, and you, you, you talked about how that happened. Did you feel, because I actually remember this, because when this came out, when, you know, after it had run a while, I'd always been a cultural Christian, but around, you know, I, w- I was starting to get more and more serious about my faith and, and, and looking and evaluating myself to see if, if this claim I had of, of truly being redeemed by Christ had any merit to it. And I, I remember finding myself, and I think a lot of people, pulling for you, don't let us down. Uh, don't make us look stupid. Um, you, you know, did did you start to feel that pressure a little bit, or were you so isolated you didn't realize that? No, I, I realized that. My my youth pastor, and you got to remember, I'm, I was an 18-year-old kid. Right. So I'm still fresh out of youth. Oh, group. yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't sure I wanted to do the show. I wanted to stay at Belmont and become a country music star. And, and I wasn't sure I wanted to move to Los Angeles and be on MTV <laughs> right. in this very short-lived genre of, of television. And yeah. uh, my youth pastor pulled me aside and he said, hey, look, you got to understand that um, God's been bringing you up and discipling you maybe for this. Like, you don't understand how many people this is going to reach and how much right. influence you could have. And so pressure's on a little bit to, to say and do the right things. I'm like, well, I'm not going to say, you know me, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a smart aleck jerk little kid most of the time. And <laughs> I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to make God look really dumb. It's like, well, you know, God doesn't really need your protection. Right. Yeah, he's that's gonna, right. Yeah. He's going to 
use you. But, uh, you know, there was some pressure, and, and there's a whole psychological thing. We could do a whole podcast on the, the psyche of a reality star because you're not playing a role. If you're playing a part, people come up to me, man, I hated your character. But if, if somebody says that to a reality person. Yeah, it's you. They, yeah. Hey, that's it's you. hard not to take it personally. Yeah. I didn't like it when you said this and yeah. when you reacted that way. It's like, well, guess what? You weren't there right. and you, you don't get to have an opinion. <laughs> oh, wait. Yes, you do. You saw it on television. So you're forming opinions. And this was before Twitter. But now yeah. reality Oh, stars, can you imagine how you get hammered immediately? Well, we just did this reunion and it's a whole different set of pressure. You know, when you're getting slammed yeah, well, on Yeah, what was internet. that like? Because we, we run into this, and, and I'm not saying that it, there's never a time that it isn't merited, so I'm not saying that. We don't, like you said, we don't always get it right. And, you know, what we say is, and I think it's, I see this with you and your country music and, and all that, is, you know, when people say, do y'all do Christian radio? And we're like, well, we're Christians who do radio. Right. And, and so we don't hide our faith. We certainly talk about our faith. And when what we find is many times – the people who are lost are the people who just don't believe what we believe. Right. The seeker, uh, the total rejection. Every now and then, you might get one of them that tries to wear you out. It's not that. It's not that often. It's normally within the church. You're not mm-hmm. doing it right. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? We take issue with how you do it. Right. And and I can't imagine mm-hmm. you had to have experienced that, especially yeah. now, probably when you came back. Yeah. For the reunion, because all that's out there and people have more access to you. So did you did you you see some of that? Because I find, and you've said this on the air before, and I saw a friend of ours say it, say it again today on speaking of Twitter on Twitter. A lot of times the 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 the, the Christian army will will shoot our own, and uh, and you know we'll take our wounded and say let's let's put you right down. Was yeah. did you experience some of that? Yeah, fortunately, I did not. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I got nothing but um, support. I mean, mm-hmm. I traveled for years after that to churches and, and mm-hmm. youth groups and conferences Good. and retreats. And hey, you, that this is the guy from the real world that stood up strong and 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 held his ground and never. I mean, again, certainly not in a perfect way, but um, uh, you know pretty much was a, was a good spokesperson for 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 who we are and so i got i got asked to come and speak uh to a lot of church youth groups and uh i mean god protected i mean there were some times i didn't say and do the yeah. right thing but uh most most of the time my character my mm. person on there right. was was mostly likable john yeah. was there what was the toughest point yeah. during that uh, and and did you ever feel like just leaving well, I did feel like leaving. It was it was the most stressful. It was twenty two weeks, so it was the most stressful wow. time in my life because all of these weird things <laughs> at happened. eighteen. You know, we, we, uh, uh, I was the youngest. Everybody yeah. else was twenty three, twenty four, uh, twenty five, yeah, yeah. and they weren't necessarily from Los Angeles, but they lived there, so they had a car. And you know, Los Angeles isn't like New York where you can get by without a car, right? And, and so they had an apartment. And when things would go crazy in the house, they'd escape to it. Well, I didn't have an escape. I didn't mm-hmm. have friends. I didn't have a car. I didn't have an apartment. So I was I was kind of trapped there, and we you know we we kicked the guy out of the house, and uh, you know one of my one of my roommates was a lesbian, and one of my roommates had an abortion on the show, and all of these things are happening, and how is eighteen year old Christian John going to respond to it? And and by the way, hey, I'm working on a on a on a music career, so I, I want to really pr- <laughs> protect yeah. the image there. I've, I've got a life mm-hmm. after this, and uh, there were so many there were so many stress factors that that made you go, why am I here? Like this is a this is the craziest thing in the world to be part of, and is it really going to be something to my benefit? And so there were a lot of times I wanted to leave, um, but most of all, it was a really valuable experience. It sounds so very cliche, but you learn a lot about yourself and you learn mm-hmm. a lot about others. But um, you know, this is before um, the internet was in every home. In 1993, I didn't have a cell phone until 1998. I don't know what year you got a cell phone, but it was it was probably not 1993. Uh, no, it wasn't. Had no. a briefcase. Uh, Bubba had it may one. shock you, 92. Yeah, Bubba had one. I did not. <laughs> was it the, the yeah. Zach Morris? Oh, yeah. yeah. It was the what I call the lunchbox. Yeah. You yeah. know, and it had the, the receiver snapped into the top of it. It's right. about 10 pounds. Right, and it was expensive. You got twenty five minutes per month. Yeah, yeah. right, right, for four hundred dollars. And he used he used it to place though a very important call. Yeah, yeah. But but the, the, <laughs> that's it, whole it has story. to do with how our show started. But, <laughs> but I didn't have one. No, I was more like you. Mine came along so, you know, much later. So the, the internet was not a thing. Um, social media was not a thing. Um, terms like woke was not there. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got to take yourself back to thirty years ago, and this the way the world has changed, and the world this this you know this woke culture. 
and this cancel culture. I mean, if 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 I had heard the word, um, you might get canceled if you respond a certain way. Yeah. I wouldn't. Have, I wouldn't have been on the dumb show. Don't I'm, know why. Yeah. I mean, it, you, you didn't have any concept yeah, of that. There's two things I wouldn't do today, and it would be be a police officer. And I come from a a, a, <laughs> a, a, a you know a family full of law enforcement. Tough gig. Or be a reality star. I just wouldn't do it because you can't win. Yeah, one. So tell me what it was like. The the show's in the can. You you showed us what that was like. <laughs> you're back in Nashville. I'm assuming you're thinking this actually can be good for your music career. I was thinking that. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And 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 then all of a sudden, people start going, "Hey, you're the guy on that TV show." Tell us how, when did that start? Happening? Everywhere I went. Right. Everywhere I went for the next twelve years, because when you turned on your television in the '90s, you know we we clicked. There wasn't this exactly. streaming and oh, let's find. Oh, that's this right. We stayed with stuff. Yeah, yeah. and so you, and and I mean, nine times out of ten, it, it you went to MTV, what? and and nine times out of ten, when you got to MTV, my house was on that show. Was was on your TV? No question. So when you went back, though, what was the moment you realized this is really a big deal? You here here it is. So I went on a mission trip. Shortly after, two weeks after, I went on a mission trip to Puerto Rico with my church group, the youth group I had just graduated out of not long ago. Wow. We hiked down in a rainforest down to a, a, um, a waterfall. Okay. I took off my shirt. I took off whatever hat I was wearing, shoes. I'm, I'm wearing swimming trunks or Nike, you know, gym shorts. Mm-hmm. And I'm standing in a waterfall in a rainforest in Puerto Rico. And somebody goes, Hey, look, it's the guy from the real world. And I'm like, there's no way. What, are, you Rico, are you in kidding me? Are you in a rainforest? Are you in a waterfall in a rainforest? I'm like, you didn't even know the, don't even have the hat either, on. Right? Uh, don't even have the hat on. No, no, it was it was nuts. I mean, it was nuts. That had to be an indicator. Of, oh, this is going to be a pretty big deal. Everywhere I went, everywhere. Um, but but it but did it turn out to be a positive for the music? That's a loaded question, and I'm still figuring that out. I went right. to Nashville, and back when they had the Nashville Network, um, uh, Lorianne Crook and Charlie Chase. Oh yeah. They booked me on their shows more than once as the guy from MTV who's a country singer is going to be on. And, mm-hmm. and I got to be on. And, uh, you know, I had I ended up with Winona Judd's manager uh, who was responsible for the Judd's career. And um, I ended up uh, getting signed to Capital Nashville Records, which was a label Garth Brooks was on. Mm-hmm. I had uh, a big time producer that worked with Alan Jackson and Brooks and Dunn. I was opening for Alabama, traveling around on a tour bus because I was the guy from the real world. Yeah. And for most all the 90s, I was living this country music star life. Um, and just on the brink of, hey, any minute, if this record label releases a single on me, I'll be the next big sensation. Because, I mean, they're just cranking out artists because of oh, the yeah. success. Of course, yeah. And I just we thought, remember all that whole era. Yeah, sure. And, and I thought, man, I'm already famous, so this is going to happen pretty easily <laughs> for me. Plus, I sang pretty good. And mm-hmm. Boy, I mean, it, it, the record label signed a guy. And they called me and they said, we just signed this guy named Tracy Adkins. Mm-hmm. I said, Tracy Adkins? And uh, yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna do you a favor. We're gonna, we're gonna go with him. We're gonna let you go. You're gonna get another record deal like next week. But if we don't release you, you're, you're you know you're not you're not gonna be able to. So, and um, and my manager, um, he got drunk one night, cussed me out. So I, I parted ways with him. Wow. And my my booking agent that booked all of Garth Brooks's things and um, was booking all of my big shows had a heart attack and died. Oh my oh, gosh. And so it all fell apart really quickly and i thought well it, it all came together pretty quickly and so i'll regroup and to this day i can't listen to honky tonk the donkey donk the same <laughs> i tear up every time we'll come back <laughs> our, our our conversation with john brennan continues next on rick and bubba university the podcast all right so bubba let's talk a little bit about tommy john i mean i know i mean we're dudes got my own right now got right? mine on right now mm-hmm. loving it it's super it, here you want me to model i'd rather not Let's don't do that okay. to our guest. But but uh, let, let's say this. This is as simple as it gets. Tommy John says, if, if Tommy John underwear is not the most comfortable pair of underwear that you've ever worn, then you know what? The, it, it's free. They, 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 they'll, they'll refund your money. Th- this is one of those things that's hard to convince you by telling I, you about it. I but know. if you try it one time... You're going to know what we're talking about. Yeah, and, and let me – I know that right now for some of you around the country, you're in blizzards. Uh, you know, some of you are actually – you're in a heat wave right now. But for all of us, you know, the next season that's coming down the pike is, is going to be uh, – is going to be spring, and then we're going to get into summer. And and let me tell you, it, 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 having Tommy John, even not just their underwear but their loungewear, all that, uh, the way that they are made – 
uh, you're going to have the comfort that that can only be created by the technology that they've established. You're going to stay cool where you want to stay cool. Uh, you're not, you know, it's going to, they're going to get out the, those micro modal fabrics and the four way stretch and the soft tri blend. Uh, you know, if you, if you wear their boxer briefs, they don't run up on your thighs. If you've got massive thighs like we tend to have, uh, you know, the waistband does not roll down. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, the loungewear and the underwear are fantastic. Ladies, they do have things for you, but the stuff we're talking about mainly is for the guys. And and we can get you 20% off your first order right now. If you just go to Tommy John, just go there right now, TommyJohn.com slash Rick Bubba. TommyJohn.com slash Rick Bubba for 20% off. Uh, and all the details are there on the site as well. TommyJohn.com slash Rick Bubba. So John Brennan is our guest. This is Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. We talked about you being on uh, MTV's Real World at 18. We talked about that ended. We talked about now how you, you your country music career really started rolling. Then you had these mishaps, and it all fell apart. Uh, we talked about that they just had you back for the 30-year reunion. So there, there's a time in there where the, the country music kind of kind of fades away. You, you never have stopped you know, being a follower of Christ and doing ministry. Tell us briefly what happened during that time and why now? Why now do you feel it's time for you to come back and, and release music? Well, so um, after uh, I toured most of the 90s, uh, people stopped booking me. There were new real world shows. There were new shows. There were new reality shows. And people had gotten tired of, of, right. of my show. And, um, you know, the booking stopped. And um, I was really trying to regroup in Nashville. And a friend of mine in Owensboro, Kentucky said, hey, I'm. I'm feeling called to start a church. I said, man, that, that's fantastic. You know I love church. Uh, yeah. I need you to come and lead the worship music because you play guitar and sing, and mm -hmm. I know you love the Lord. And I said, well, I'll help you out for about four or five weeks because, um, you know, I'm going to regroup my music career, so I can do that temporarily. Oh, well, I was there for four or five years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I dropped out of Belmont, so I had never been to college, finished college. I'd never been to seminary, but I was thrust into the ministry. I became the youth pastor and the worship pastor of that church. And then, oddly enough, I went from there uh, to about mm, 200 yards from where we're sitting at this church in Birmingham, Alabama, yeah. where, where I had um, been a guest speaker at yeah. a retreat as the, guest, as the guy from the real world. Uh, moved down to Tampa Bay, Florida, and St. Petersburg as a youth pastor, and then uh, did some work in in East Africa and Uganda and Kenya, and and uh, and and then over here, uh, you know, in uh, Clay County, Alabama. Yeah, Ashland. Yeah, Ashland, mm -hmm. Alabama. Yeah, very familiar with that. Which you know, I'm from Kentucky, so there's an Ashland, Kentucky. Right. Yeah. And then there's I lived in Clay County, Alabama, named <laughs> after Henry Clay. Yeah. Which you know, there's everything's named Henry Clay up in Lexington, Kentucky. There you go. <laughs> and so I was re really confused and had to research all of that. <laughs> it was kind of a Kentucky outlet. Here. Yeah. So yeah. I've lived in Alabama for 12 years and never never planned on it, but uh, you know, got got thrown into in the ministry. At, and working for churches, which I loved every minute of. And um, and then, you know, my father was the one that really got me into country music. I mean, Willie and Waylon and sure. George Jones, when I was a kid on the radio, we just we always played country music. And I, I, I was singing Roll On 18 Wheeler when I was seven years old. And my mom <laughs> said, man, John can sing. And yeah. so we lived in Phoenix at the time. My dad got me to sing the national anthem for the Phoenix Suns. Wow. When I was eight years old. So oh I wasn't any good at baseball, but I sang the national anthem all my little league games. That's, That's funny. funny. Yeah, that yeah. Is funny. And so, um, yeah, I, I was just, I was in the shower in Ashland, Alabama, and, um, and my phone had rang the week before about this reunion, and, and I thought, man, I really miss singing, and uh, maybe I could use this reunion to, to get thrown back out there and let people know it was still in my heart to sing, and, and I thought, man you're not done singing yet. And I thought, write that song. Right. Because, and I had not been a, you know, tremendous songwriter at that time. I'd, I didn't sit down and, and go, I got something on my heart I'd like to write. But at that moment I knew you ain't done singing yet. You got to write that song. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, man, I need somebody to, to, to help me do this. And it's so crazy. This is a crazy story. I, I, I got an Instagram direct message from a guy that says, Hey, are, are you going to do any of these OG shows that they're advertising? Are you going to be on any of these reunion shows? Cause I'm a big fan of you and I'm a big fan of your show. And I'm like, I'm reading who this is from. And it's got a blue check mark next to it. I said, is this shooter Jennings? And he said, yeah, man, me and my wife <laughs> think you're awesome. I'm like, 
is this a shooter Jennings, son of Waylon and Jesse? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, man. I'm like, okay, look, I live in Alabama, but I'm going to come to Nashville. We're going to hang out. And he's like, well, I grew up in Nashville, so I don't really like it there. I live in L.A. And, and but I'm like, listen, I got to tell you something. I sing country music because my dad loved your father. Yeah. And so I'm buddies with Shooter Jennings now. How, is that? <laughs> how weird is that? It's so great. Yeah. So I said, Shooter, how can you help me? And he said, I don't know. What do you want to do? I said, I want to write a song. So he said, okay, my buddy Aaron Ray Tier is a great songwriter. As a matter of fact, he's a Grammy Award winning songwriter. I said, okay, will he write with me? That'll said, do. Sure, I will. So I meet with Aaron Raytier in, in, on Music Row. I walk in. I say, hey, Aaron, uh, you know Shooter? He's like, yeah, man, I know Shooter. And you know Shooter? I'm like, yeah, kind of. And he, I said, where are you from? Just making conversation. He goes, Danville, Kentucky. I said, Ooh. really? Oh, here we go. And uh, and I said, Shooter said you had a Grammy. He said, yeah, it's up there on the shelf and points to it. And <laughs> he said, so one day my boss, the guy I write for, said, you want to write a song with Lady Gaga? And I said, yeah. He said, okay, be at the airport. You're flying to L.A. And he won a Grammy for a song that's in the movie A Star is Born. Oh, yeah. yeah. He co-wrote with uh, with Lady Gaga and five or six other people. And and so he co-wrote the song. I ain't done singing yet with me. How about that? And, that, and that's the one. I mean, you now. That's a good pedigree to the have way, on your side. The way it is now, you know, you, you have come back to a whole new industry. I'm finding that out. Yeah, and it, and we're 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 adapting as well. It's crazy, and it's all about streaming, and yeah. you know, and anybody can crank out music, but and right. that can be good, but that can yeah. also be bad because anybody can crank out music. You know, it's like I was talking to we interviewed a, a worship leader, and he said, "Yeah, he said I'll be told by people, you we got to do this song, we got to do this song." He goes, I listen to it. It sounds fantastic. And I look, and it's done in somebody's house, and only a 1,000 people have ever even heard it. Right. And he's like, what, what people can crank out of their houses and, and stuff yeah. is, is crazy. So you, the market gets flooded with so much. Yeah. But the good news is you can get your music out if we can just get people to find it. Yeah. It, it, it changed a lot. Like in, in 1990s when I was, you know, on Music Row, it was, you know, you get signed by a record label and they put a million dollars behind you. You're on the radio and mm -hmm. you're a big star. So it, you just got to win the lottery and, and get their attention. And if you stick at it, you know, long enough, you'll get their attention. So it's not like that at all, I'm finding. Like I can tell you in the last, you know, two weeks, 20 people on Music Row have said, John, you got to get everything you know about the 90s out of the way. Yeah. Now it's all about... um <clears throat> TikTok and Spotify. You got to get on TikTok and you got to get on Spotify. And I'm like, well, I'm morally opposed to TikTok as a youth <laughs> pastor. Right, yeah. And as a Christian, I'm uh and as an American. Right. <laughs> There's so many but I'm on <laughs> but but I'm on it because you told me I had to be. And yeah. uh, by the way, I'm on TikTok and I'm on Spotify, but until you help me get on the radio, nobody knows I'm on TikTok and I'm on Spotify. Right. And so it's it's the dog chasing the tail. It's a catch twenty two. You know, you got to yep. you got to get a million streams or you got to get a million followers. Oh, yeah. And then the record companies, you know, will say, OK, you've got your fan base. It's like, well, at that point, do I even need you? That's what you guys used to do. It's not the way <laughs> yeah. it's working now. And so it's really a catch 22. It doesn't even resemble the music business the way it used to be. All right. We want to come back and talk about the music that you got out now. When Rick and Bubba University, the podcast continues. This is the Rick and Bubba Show. Watch more at blazetv.com slash Rick and Bubba. Rick and Bubba, Rick and Bubba. So John Brennan is our guest. Uh, and, and if you are looking, uh, I, you know, we talked about Spotify. We talked about TikTok. We, we talked about, uh, you know, your website. If, and, you know, the, it, it's on YouTube. You, you sent us the links. I've listened to. I ain't done singing yet, but I, I had to hear Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, too, and, <laughs> and, and move on. And, and uh, you know, the music is, is available. What, what it's an EP, uh, but but and you you know I guess you decide who the, what the single is. Now you don't have an A and R guy anymore. I mean, how does this work? <laughs> I mean, you just do you just declare this this is the yeah. I think this one has the best chance to catch or kinda yeah. Uh, I brought these to you guys. These are called CDs and <laughs> <laughs> these uh. You know, I thought those were coasters you brought they, they, in. They're, they're coasters yeah. and frisbees. Yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I used to, I used to try to hand these out to the teenagers I was, I was mentoring, and, and they said, John, we we don't have a CD player. Yeah. Like, well, yeah, right. you do in your car. You probably do. And they're like, no, no, no we don't. Yeah. Like, you're driving a car that's so new, you don't have a, a CD player. You're a brat. Okay? <laughs> no, but, no, that's true. Uh, yeah. So I, I uh, a friend of mine turned me on to an organization, a distribution company in Nashville called CDX, and what they do is they used to mail out CDs to radio stations, but now they digitally distribute it and uh, they still do cds for those that request it but um uh, the guy that runs uh cdx said man i 
I know who you are and I love your music. What if, uh, what if, what if you came on to, to CDX Records and, uh, and we kind of acted as a label with you too? I'm like, you know, there's not a long line of people right. saying that to me. <laughs> so Let me think it over. Yeah. Yeah. Let me think I'll have it. my people uh, to call you. My people said yes. Yeah, and, right. uh, yeah, and so I Ain't Done Seeing Yet was, was you know, the, the obvious first single. And the next one is uh, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, because, you know, that's, that's just, where you've been. That's my corridor, and yeah. <laughs> uh, that's actually the next single. And, uh, yeah, and so I, I just I played it for people, and they, <clears throat> they said that that was the catchy one. That should have been first. Some of them said, and I said, "Well, yeah. I got to go with ain't done singing yet first because that's that's my comeback." Story. Well, you're also saying mm-hmm. who you are. Yeah, yeah, that's what we mean. Yeah, but uh, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky is an old. It's a it's a it's a boogie, and it's a, it's fun. It's catchy and memorable. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I don't I don't come from the cloth where you you wear skinny jeans and baseball hats. You know, I come if you're a country music singer, you, you need to wear men's jeans. Right. And, and I'm, I'm a cowboy boot, cowboy hat kind of guy. And, and I really just um, like to see the music turn back even more traditional, or at least back to, you know, where there's fiddle and steel guitar and it doesn't sound like 80s rock music. But I like the 80s rock music. Yeah. I yeah. like it. It's just, it's like George Jones told Carrie Underwood, you got to call it something different. Right. <laughs> but it's not country music. It's good music. But, uh, you know, who knows what, what's going to happen with, with the way music goes. But I'm just going to put out music I like and hope people like it. What's the response been like? People that hear it love it. Yeah, um, but the key, like, we're here today. We're trying to be sure that people yeah. know. Do you, you know that's, that's that, you know, know. You know how do you ever, you get, I understand once you build, and you use a term Bob and I've had to deal with, once you build your tribe, mm-hmm. it's easy how it works. Now you're yeah. just feeding it. And the tribe right. grows. I didn't know but, we needed a yeah, tribe. But but the getting the getting the huh? building the tribe is the difficult part. Yeah, you know, and you've got some name recognition, so that helps. And yeah. uh, and I, even though it was a long time ago, when when these iconic shows, people remember them. People people, you know, I mean, it, it, it for when I say things like, "Hey, we're having John Brennan on," they're like, "John Brennan," I said. Cowboy guy that was on MTV's Real World from yeah. Kentucky. Oh yeah, right. you know, and and then yeah. immediately it still does have. Yeah, I mean, it, it still brings. Uh, it, it solves a lot of trying to explain who you are. Well, the fourth song on this EP is is a song called um, "I'm Only in It for the Love," which was a number one hit for John Conley back in the '80s, and um, somebody played it for him and he loved it. And they said, uh, "Well, I'm glad you like it." He actually uh, is dying to sing this song, talking about me, on the Grand Ole Opry with you. He said, well, I'm on Friday and Saturday. You tell him to choose and come on. Wow. And so I was, I was in Alabama. I said, I'm in Alabama. I got to go to Kentucky and get my mom and get to Nashville. <laughs> and that's what we did. And my brother brought her down. What was that there. like? It was amazing. I mean, um, I wish my dad could have been there. Maybe yeah. I don't know how heaven works, but maybe he got to hear it. But, you know, you walk out there and, and you're singing, and John Conley calls you out and says, hey, y'all make welcome. This guy's going to sing with me, John Brennan. And, and so they politely golf clapped because John Conley asked him to. Mm. And then <laughs> – and they said, John, uh, step up here in the, in the circle. And uh, I've got I've got the video of it in, in my, my YouTube link, so anybody that wants to uh, to see it. And uh, he said, tell them who you are because, you know, tell remind them. And I said, well, okay. So before there was Survivor and the Kardashians, there was the real world on MTV. And you could just hear the crowd That's go, what I mean. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And That's so, him. That's him. Yeah, yeah. half the battle is uh, – well, it was people my age going, I remember when he was, uh, you mm-hmm. know, I was at a wedding this summer and Dan Bongino was there. And uh, because the, the girl that was on A Real World after me, the season after me, became a good friend and, and her daughter was getting married. So I got to go. I was singing. And um, and, and Dan Bongino was there. And uh, well, it, was at, it was at Trump's uh, reception at his golf club up yeah. there in, in New Jersey. And, and he was Trump was there. And everybody's taking pictures of him. I walked up to Dan Bongino and said, can I get a selfie with you? He goes, Donald Trump is standing right there. I said, yeah, but he's busy and I'm never going to get close to him. But <laughs> right. And he goes, do I know you? I'm like, I don't think so. And he said, were we in the secret service together? I said, no. <laughs> and right about that time, somebody said, don't tell him who you are. And he goes, oh my gosh, I grew up with you. And he's exactly my age. And right. he's, I feel like I've known you for 30 years. I said, well, you kind of do. And <laughs> I see you on TV too. So it's just weird. And, and what you're hoping is that people will go, uh, um, I've been pulling for this guy since he lived in that crazy house <laughs> and let me see if I like his music. And then, you know, and, and then it's this whole thing of, you know, can, can I, can I develop this, you know, Spotify following? Can I get a, a million TikTok, Spotify streams? What, you know, all the stuff yeah, all that, that you got to do. Yeah. 
And I don't know if I can. I'm just I'm just going to sing like crazy and post like crazy and, and, and you know, say, uh, for me, I still love radio. And so to me, you know, what they say, how do you make it? And for me, that answer is you make it when you're on country radio, when you're when you're nominated for an act, when you're on the Grand Ole Opry, when you're opening for George Strait, you've made it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you used to spend three or four hundred thousand dollars or up to a million dollars making a record on two inch tape in Nashville. Now you can literally make a record on your MacBook and mm-hmm. put it on Spotify and everybody's a singer. And I think that's good for people like me that, you know, haven't won the lottery and a record label didn't sign you. You want to put your music out there. Yeah. And uh, but now now's the battle of uh, making the general public know that it's out there so that they can go to Spotify or TikTok or, you know, call a radio station or 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 whatever it takes to to put it out there to the masses so that. You know, you can you can continue to do it. <laughs> yeah, when, and and so really, if I'm looking for the stuff now, I just I just go to YouTube and search your name. I go to yeah. Spotify. What what do I do? How do I get it? So if somebody's it, listening to this or watching this right so now, so you you can you can Spotify search John Brennan. I ain't done singing yet. Yeah. Um, you can go to JohnBrennan.com. You can I'm on I'm on TikTok uh, because of the Paramount Plus uh, reunion show. I'm, yeah. I'm verified on Twitter. Facebook and Instagram and, you know, find me on social media. I'm trying to post a lot and, uh, it's really me. I don't have a person handling my stuff. That's me. <laughs> and, uh, and tag your radio station that plays country music and say, you want to hear John Brennan. I ain't done singing yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, so are you all in on this now? I'm are you still in. doing anything else or is this it? I mean, I'm always just loving people and loving God and of serving, course. but yeah. I'm, I'm full time chasing this dream. And, uh, you know, that's a scary situation, real uncertain because, uh, you know, I'm not 18 and famous anymore. I'm, you know, I'm 48 and nobody cares. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I still got a song in my heart. And, and to tell you the truth, I think I sing better than I ever have. And I'm excited. I'm excited about the journey. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. God has blessed my life. And uh, this is um, this is something he allows me to do. I'm having a blast with it. And I want to do it on a major scale. And, and yeah. maybe it can be more enjoyable this time because, yeah. like I say, you're older, you're wiser, you've been there, and you know what's important. And yeah. uh, you know, if, if if God paves this way for you, it's going to be so much more fun now. I think. Yeah, and perspective is everything. You know, um, country music used to. I was literally told in Nashville, well. Um, you're on MTV. That doesn't click. Uh, and now they want every every reality star gets a record deal now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But before they, you know, when I was the reality star, it's kind of like, what is that? <laughs> uh, you know, you don't sleep around. Mm-hmm. You, you don't you don't drink, and you don't do all these crazy things. You know, you're 18. You're gonna have to come back when you have a little bit of like edge. His, edge. Yeah. And so, for lack of a so better term, when I was about 30, I even though, by to, the way, the way you were living your life was actually being edgy. They just yeah, didn't get it. Yeah. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so edgy that they didn't understand me, but it really is yeah. because the way, what they wanted, well, that's how most of the world lives. Yeah. The way you were living actually was unique. Yeah. And, and still is unique. Yeah. And, uh, and to Bubba's point, when you're 48, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, you probably have. You probably can write songs better because yeah. you, you got a lot more to write yeah. about. Yeah, <laughs> I went back to Nashville and they said, "I said, hey, I'm not 18 anymore. I'm I'm 28." And, and they said, "We just signed Hunter Hayes and Taylor Swift." I'm like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I just can't quite hit that. Window. I don't usually curse, but I'm about to. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're pulling for you, and thanks Thank you. for reaching out to us yeah. because uh, you've you've been kind and and God's kind of crossed uh, our paths with you being part of a. Uh, our home state, and then you know, like I say, I remember when you and I ended up at one of the churches you were, uh, you know, serving at at one time, and and I had that same reaction. Oh yeah, you're the guy from you're the guy from uh, the, the MTV thing. <laughs> yeah. And, well, uh, I remember when I moved you're here. You're the guy. Yeah. And they told me they said you're gonna love Rick and Bubba, and I said, well, tell me about Rick and Bubba. All oh, these guys on the radio, and they they love country music, and they but they they talk about Jesus. I'm like, there, that's bull. Is it a Christian station? They're like, no, these guys are just being themselves. I'm like. Whatever. And man, I, I, I love you guys. And you Thank use you. your platform and people all over the country love you. And, and I'm honored to be here with you guys. Well, it's it our is, pleasure. Yeah. So all right, here's what we're going to do. We got to take, I ain't done singing yet. And it's, and we got to make it mammoth. Yep. I mean, everybody's got to go out. You got to get it and, uh, and go find all the social media stuff, media stuff with John Brennan. Uh, his website is John Brennan, B R E N N A N.com. You can go there for all the information too. 
And uh, John, we are we're pulling for you. We're here for you, and uh, you, you know we'll probably work that into some bed it, music on the big show too. And, and John, all right. I, I got to tell you though, you you said something and it, it's resonated. You've made some comedy with it. I really think you've got to write a song called a forty eight year old MTV star. <laughs> well. All right, I'm, the cat's going to be out of the bag, but I'm, I'm knee-deep in writing a song called MTV Cowboy. <laughs> I am. You name another MTV Cowboy, I bet you can. I bet you can. John Brennan, thanks for being with us, and, and thanks to all of you for being with us on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast.